Hello, I'm Pilgrim Beard of Device Pilot. Uh, with me here today, I'm very pleased to welcome Phil Nunn of JumpTech to share his experiences in smart energy. Welcome, Phil. Thank you for having me. So how did you get into smart energy in the first place? Um, it was in my previous business, actually, initially, uh, Keaton Solutions. We built a platform that was used for the, uh, a lot of the smart meter installs. Um, and we came across that, goodness knows, like um, early 2014, 20, uh, 13, 14, I think. Um, and yeah, ended up building a platform that's used for gas meter installs and then dual fuel and then smart came along and uh, our platform was used by a lot of the big energy suppliers to install um, the, the, the smart gas and electric meters. Um, so yeah, very much kind of stumbled into it in the early days, but then saw it was a, a real opportunity to build something there in that niche. Great. So that was your previous company and now you're running Jump Tech. Can you tell us a little bit more about what Jump Tech does in smart energy? Yes. Yeah, so the... Uh, the journey was very, uh, uh, very interesting journey where I, I moved from selling that business in 2016 to uh, SMS PLC, um, at which point I bought an electric car and had a charger installed and then recognized that the uh, process of having a charger installed was uh, both complex and something that needed to be able to scale. Um, and the experience we'd had from Qton for building that, that platform and that business was very relevant to uh, low carbon technologies, and in particular uh, EV charger installs. So, um, yeah, in 2016, um, I sold the business in 2018, I, uh, I left SMS and set up JumpTech and uh, essentially um, started working with installers to see how we could help streamline their process. So it was everything from how do you simplify the survey that the customer um, could do themselves um, through to making sure that when the engineer did the install, it was compliant and all the correct data was collected. Um, and that was particularly relevant where we could see that as an industry that was good, we anticipated and hoped was going to scale up soon and rapidly that being able to guide engineers through that process, for example, and being able to make it much more prescriptive was very valuable. Um, and in 2018, 2019, that wasn't so much the case, um, but in the last 18 months or so, things have really ramped up and now um, we're seeing significant traction and value that, that we can add to the platform. Great. Yes. I mean, I repeatedly hear that uh, installation is a bottleneck um, for EV charging. So one of the things that's interesting in any new market is, is as it becomes an ecosystem and you start to have clearly differentiated types of player in the market, each perhaps focusing on just one part of the, the value chain. So can you just, just briefly explain who your customers are? I mean, to some extent, you're presumably serving the people who um, want the charge points installed, the, the, the charge point operators are they mainly, um, but then there's some people who've got to do that as well. Do you have an offering for them? Could you just talk a little bit about how your, you know, your role in helping to sort of join up the ecosystem and who, who are the players that you interact with and, and deliver value to, whether or not you charge them directly for that, but uh, you know, you're sort of helping to join them up. Yeah, these, the multiple stakeholders is definitely um, a, a key, key part of what, what, what was kind of hold wood cold and industry back or make it harder for it to scale and grow efficiently. And, and we saw that in metering where um, we were involved with meter asset owners and then meter asset providers and then the maintenance people and installers, and they're all different organizations with different, um, different priorities. And in a similar way in EV, we see that effectively you have people who want charge and need charge points installed, organizations such as car dealers, car manufacturers, energy suppliers, um, and then you have uh, organizations that actually do the install themselves. And in the very early days with the likes of Popcoin and BP Charge Masters, it was then they had to do everything because there weren't any EV charger installers. So you'll find a very vertically integrated uh, business. Today you have OEMs and, and, and manufacturers who manufacture chargers, and then you have uh, uh, companies of electricians and engineers and installers who go and do the install. Um, and then you have the energy suppliers as well um, on, on top. So um, yeah, what we do is we essentially provide the tool to the installers to go and do the work efficiently. So that means that they can they can schedule and manage their engineers and do the quoting and, and actually carry our mobile app when the engineers are on site. But also there's a big requirement for, from car manufacturers and the charger manufacturers themselves to manage that customer journey and have visibility and know what's going on with that and to be able to define it as well. So we enable them to design their own customer journey, um, have complete visibility on that, and then that customer journey effectively in the type in, in uh, as a workflow goes onto the installers platform and then that's the journey they follow and then that gives the visibility to the uh, the charge manufacturer or the car manufacturer to see what's going on with their customers and the ability the ability to performance manage and, and report on those 
So they need to know if a job was aborted. They need to know if the engineers are turning up on time. They need to know if their leads to be converted. There's a lot of um, insights that we can give um, to, for them to know in advance how their customer journey is going on, what their customer experience is. Not very clear. So you talked earlier on about how the market was very early in 2019. Here we are, 2022. It's a bit less uh, immature, but probably still some way to go. I mean, any thoughts on on where the market's at at the moment? Uh, you know, where where does the industry stand? Kind of what's the next? What's happening to the industry at the moment, and what's going to happen in the next few years? Yeah, it's very interesting to observe. I mean, it is it's moving fast, but it's also very big changes. And you know, when I bought my electric car in 2018, I think we all agreed that we were kind of suffering together as early adopters who'd made this crazy decision, which gave us a very, very high level of tolerance for all sorts of things, um, be it bugs in the software. Um, there's one point where I couldn't untether my car from this charger without walking around the car five times or something peculiar. Um, now we're seeing that tolerance uh, drop off, I think, as we're moving from the kind of uh, innovators and early adopters into the early majority and um, and the mass market coming in, just expecting things to work. Um, and there being a huge need for education amongst those people as to, you know, the way EVs are and, and how people drive them and when you charge them and, and all that kind of thing. And not really just um, taking the habits of a of a petrol car that you can fill up in five minutes and thinking that you could behave in the same way with an EV. Um, but then once, once you recognize that if you're fortunate, you can charge at home that, you know, you always have a full tank, but you wake up in the morning and the benefits of that. Um, and then planning a bit more and maybe slowing your life down a little bit, which could be healthy too. So I think, but, but we see that manifesting in kind of like frustration or, you know, people getting um, annoyed that things don't work or whatever as well. So I think we're in a kind of fairly bumpy phase around, a lack of education, but the adoption happening at the same time. So, and that's in that's not just amongst the general public. We see that in the industry generally as well. A lot of yeah. newcomers come into the space, not having a very clear understanding of like how things all fit together and trying to figure it all out, um, um, which is interesting and exciting to observe as well. And, yeah, yeah we, we, we're glad to be part of it. Yeah, so interesting to see what all of that does is pile pressure on all the operational teams and mechanisms within uh, within you know the companies that are providing uh, charge points uh, and operating them. Um, and uh, yeah, doing that whilst growing fast is is quite challenging, isn't it? So um, in the UK, there's a there was a grant scheme or is still a grant scheme, uh, the OZEV um, uh, home. EV home charge scheme or something, which I think is a 350 pounds um, subsidy for installing a, a charge point uh, outside your home. That's coming to an end um, at the end of March. Any thoughts about what that will do to the industry? I mean, we could sort of imagine, we've seen this before with things like solar PV and so on, that obviously in the short term, it, it causes a, a peak in bookings and then perhaps a bit of a dip behind that. But at a slightly larger scale, what's you know do, do you think that will drive any shift in the industry um i guess um the home charge scheme is is ending um in its current form and it's moving more towards um, supporting uh, multi occupancy dwellings um flats and so forth and uh, which i think makes a lot of sense you know i think it's much, much harder there's a greater challenge around getting those charge points installed. Um, I think for the people uh, at home um, and having the domestic charge points installed and the industry behind that, so the charge point manufacturers, the installers, we're seeing them need to evolve their, their business model from uh, what it currently is. Um, and that's really because it now becomes a, a significantly more capital cost. Um, so I think that's the, the downside. I think the upside is that now um, they have much more flexibility on the way they construct their business models to spread that cost out or and to kind of pivot that into more of a service than just a one-off uh, install, but then provide more of an ongoing service uh, with ongoing monthly payments rather than just the capital cost to, to those customers. So I think we'll definitely see that evolving. Mm. Do, you, do you see so i can see that you know providing it as a financed product effectively is one way to spread out the um the, the capital cost but do you see any other sort of changes happening in the market that that are sort of going more towards an ongoing service kind of relationship rather than a product relationship um in terms of ev charging yes i think there are some companies out there i think uh, that they're looking to offer those kind of things. And I think where this also becomes significant is where it's not just an early adopter having bought an EV is a kind of a gadget, I guess, almost a component of that and the, and the tolerance that comes with those early adopters, but also then it becoming like a business critical um, uh, uh, investment. And, you know, the, 
the the people who have to wake up in the morning and they can't do their job because the car's not charged and that's a, a or their van to go and do their deliveries all those kind of things it becomes a very very different thing so it's not just an inconvenience there's a very very significant business cost associated and therefore i think seeing maintenance with response times and predictive maintenance and all these kind of things is definitely something we're going to see them moving towards um and you know there's a lot of fleets out there that are charged at home a lot of the vans get taken home at night and they will need to be charged at home wherever possible um, and it's important that that infrastructure is uh, is, is maintained and, and, and that it works correctly. Otherwise, you know, you're going to see all sorts of ramifications. Yeah. So I don't know about you, but from people I've talked to recently, it feels like more and more organizations are sort of facing up to the net zero challenge and are starting to um, make big commitments to their shareholders about when they're going to achieve net zero and so on. And, and that's then rippling down into behavior and planning, you know, um, month by month, week by week. Uh, but but as, as you say, big challenges, and it's not often obvious even how to address them. I mean, if you're speaking to a company that's getting into EV charging in any way, and lots of different companies are from different directions, um, do you have any kind of thoughts really about how they should think about that stuff, what sort of mindset they should have? Um, what, will it have any other effects on their business that they haven't haven't thought of? You know, some, sometimes people tend to view change like this as just a kind of thing that you do and then forget about. But often, the businesses actually change. It changes the whole business and the way it thinks and the way it works. And any thoughts about the sort of mind sh the mindset shift that we might be going through? Um, I think I think one of the areas is uh, it's important for businesses uh, who are involved in EV charging, like provision of service, et cetera, to be very, very clear and focused on like where they fit in the market. Um, and the difference between high volume domestic installs versus like uh, commercial installs or public um, DC charging infrastructure, for example, is huge. And, and one, you know, worrying about customer journey and then the other worrying more about maybe like, you know, multiple companies being involved with groundworks and reinstatement and all those kind of things as well. So I think understanding and be very clear on exactly where the opportunity is for them with their strengths and where they fit. But I think also then uh, appreciating the capital cost that comes with then providing those services ongoing. And so the organizations that are looking to provide more of charging as a service, be it public or, or for domestic use, um, need access to significant capital, um, partly for the hardware, partly for the cost of the install, partly just to get more man, men in vans and all the, all the stuff that goes with that. Um, and making sure that they've got the, the deep pockets to do that um, because it does get very expensive very quickly. Great. Well, it's been fascinating talking to you, Phil. Uh, we're at the beginning of what's clearly going to be a very exciting journey. I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts with us today. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure.